At what point in your life as an artist did you realize you weren't working strictly within established conventions, or you were sort of in creating your own conventions in a way? I mean, was there an aha moment, or um, you know, I didn't um, study or start studying sculpture until I was in grad school, and um, up until then, well, just before grad school actually, um, up until then, I was painting and. Um, you know, doing some photography, and um, so I was more into um, two-dimensional mediums. You know, I, I really didn't connect with um, sculpture or any, like, three-dimensional objects until um, I was out of school, out of undergrad. I, I had this idea. I was, um, I was at this park with a pond, and I was watching all these um, ducks swimming around in this pond, and, um, and I thought, it'd be fun to make something that I can interact with the ducks and so I made this um, remote control duck and that was like my my first attempt at um, a, a three-dimensional object and I, I love the um, you know I just kind of fell in love with the process you know I, uh, for the first time I worked with fiberglass and Mondo and um, it was just a um, you know really eye-opening for me because I I didn't realize that um, you know, sculpture could be made out of that sort of materials. Or I, I never had access to all the, you know, materials that I use. I'm, I'm self-taught, you know. I mean, I, there's been a couple of significant teachers along the way, but um, mostly sort of trial and error and, um, you know, YouTube video, like tutorials, that kind of stuff. And I, I, I try to keep myself um, as open as possible to different possibilities. So... You know, um, the look that I get is completely based on, um, you know, what what I decide to use or what I, um, you know, sort of on a on a whim almost. Um, I'll look at, you know, think about a project, and um, I try to sort of come up with the best way to make that. And um, sometimes it requires materials that aren't so conventional. Um, and I have to learn new things to, to get there. And so um, I'm constantly sort of grabbing new materials, new techniques, um, new processes. Um, and also, um, you know, like as an artist, I kind of get bored at doing the same thing over and over. And so I like variety. It keeps it fresh for me. Um, and, I, and I hope that it's, uh, it keeps it fresh for the viewers as well. It, to me, it was just refreshing because there's there's a quality of humor, and then there's this there are, there are serious undertones, and then at the same time, it feels like it's something you'd see uh, in the middle of a black hole or something. But then at the same time, it's very intimate and personal um, and human. Mm -hmm. So there's just like a lot of play. It seems like it'd be hard to find that balance, but I think mm. you found it. Who are your biggest influences? Um, artists. I mean, well, what? Yeah, I mean, artists. Um, what are all the influences that go into okay. finding that sort of balance? Well, um, I'm mean, definitely in influenced by um, you know a lot of um, uh, contemporary artists. Um, one of my biggest influences is uh, Wendell Gladstone. He's an LA artist. Um, he sort of, when I was in grad school, he sort of um, um, you know sort of took me under his wings and. Um, helped me develop some um, techniques that I hadn't, um, you know, used before. And um, so he's, he's an artist that I look up to a lot. And not just for his, um, the work that he does, um, which is incredible, but um, also his work ethic and, you know, constantly chipping at it, you know. Yeah. You know, that's something that I sort of aspire to be, you know, being able to make work all the time, you know. Um, I'm certainly influenced by, um, you know, artists like um, Takashi Murakami. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, we, we have, I mean, he's much older than me, but he, he has a similar like, aesthetic background, you know, growing up in Japan myself. Um, I think we have similar influences. Um, and, and, the, and the fact that he is able to... Um, you know, maneuver through all these different media, and um, he's, he's somebody who does a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. I'm influenced by my peers. 
um, a lot of artists, friends around me, um, and just life in general. You know, where it's where I draw my um, inspirations or draw my sources from. You know, I'm constantly, you know, as I'm doing life, I'm, I'm sort of um, paying attention to details that I would want to um, retell in my work, I guess. This kind of theme of sort of decay and regeneration and cycles, life mm. cycles and stuff. So what uh, what do you think happens when people die? <laughs> well, I happen to be a believer of Christ, and so um, I believe in eternal life and um, heaven. And, uh, but, you know, I think it's... Um, it's a broad topic that um, I like to sort of present, um, and not not to be like didactic about it, or uh, I don't know, like I, I don't I don't want to be um, preaching in my work, right? Um, but at the same time, I, I present um, my own sort of point of view and sort of present it um, as you know, this is what I believe, kind of thing, and and I think. Um, there's room for um, disagreements and, and uh, discussion, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not necessarily after um, a specific idea. You know, I'm presenting this idea, but it's always, you know, sort of up for interpretation or open for that. Yeah. You sort of play around with the uh, this idea of the end of the world um, mm -hmm. with. Um, I mean, all this imagery of the idea that nothing ever really ends, and there's always just transformation. And uh, but at the same time, then you have these signs that say this is the end, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the piece, the, the video piece, the last sunset again. So, um, which is it? Is it the end, or is it unending transformation? You know, the, the, those couple pieces that I'm specifically talking about—the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek, po poking fun at the fact that, um, you know, the, the the prediction of the end of the world kind of thing. I don't know, I found humor in that. I thought it's kind of funny that um, the end date of the show is after the end date of the world. Yeah. And so, um, so I started thinking about that. And But I do like the idea that, um, you know, when, when something's decaying, you know, like it, 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 it sort of leaves room for something else to um, sprout out of that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm um, answering your question. No, it's fine. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> Is it, do you find an ongoing relationship between your art and like what you believe around about the world? Because my experience, like I'll have beliefs and then they'll inform my art and then my art will reflect that or sometimes Sure. reaffirm or challenge my beliefs yeah. and there's kind of like a give and take mm -hmm. do you find that kind of yeah I do you know I mean I think um, my my goal or my hope is that all my works um, sort of come from who I am you know as a person um, and so it, it, it should be informed by you know the things that I stand for and the things that I believe in but you know I'm not a I mean, I question myself all the time, yeah. and so um, there's definitely um, wiggle room there. And yeah. um, you know, sometimes um, I'll, I'll make something that's you know that I feel pretty um, good about. You know, um, months or years down the road, you know, I, I look back and um, kind of wonder what I was thinking then. And, um, so, and I, I think that's okay. I, I like that. Um, you know, the the work sort of. Um, touches on my personal history, not not as um, just a narrative of you know what the work is referencing, but also um, you know the history in terms of like when I made the piece, yeah. how how um, how it's informed by you know who I was or what I was doing at that moment. Right. Well, like kind of on those lines, like uh, impossible container is sort of about how we kind of can try to contain these large ideas mm -hmm. like about God and things like that sure. and struggling to find understanding and so we try to box things. In the, so what is your easy to stand definition of God? 
Right. Yeah. Well, you know, um, yeah, so I don't know. I think my um, parameter um, around, around that idea of God is that uh, God is a loving and um, uh, just God. Um, and, um, and and that's sort of like you know my my humanly interpretation of it. The the problem or the um, I don't know the difficulty lies in the fact that my definition of love and justice and peace and you know all of those ideas that um, I associate God with um, isn't the same definition I think for um, God Himself, and so. Um, you know, God's economy, God's sense of justice is different um, from, from my sense of justice, yeah. all of those things. So um, that's where the conflict comes in, you know. And, and, and so those are things that um, can't quite be contained within the box. Right. You know, I, I understand when, um, you know, people of faith, um, you know, get rocked when something um, you know, tragic happens to their family or something like that. And, and um, you know, I, I don't, um, I don't know the answer. I don't have a, you know, hard and fast rule. But um, you know, I guess I choose to believe in um, the God that I believe in, um, and I believe those things are, you know, justice and love, and all those things are true, um, whether um, whether I can comprehend it or not. Right. Sort of like this acknowledgement. That there's just so much that we just can't grasp. Yeah. You know. Right. Just leaving it. Yeah, and, and, and trusting that, you know, God's in control, I guess. Some of the pieces I love, like Nice Try and, and the Fail pieces, there seems to be this fear of failure, especially like within well, the culture I grew up in and the education system. Kids don't really seem to be encouraged to take risks mm -hmm. where they might possibly fail. So what are, what are some risks and failures that you've experienced as an artist that wound up sort of being a positive, you know, that might have inspired those pieces? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, I mean, the sort of the earliest and the biggest one that I can think of is um, going to grad school um, or even pursuing art in school in undergrad. From, from the outside, it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, kind of the the education system and the world and all the teachers, um, not all, uh, many teachers would say, um, you know, there, there's uh, really no, um, not a lot of um, value in art education um, because it, it is it's 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 difficult. It's um, it's expensive. It's uh, you know, it's, it's not lucrative. Um, it's, uh, you know, time-consuming, you know, all, all those things. But um, but at the same time, like it's a, it's also it can be um, extremely rewarding at times. And, um, so you know, th there's a certain risk there, and uh, in believing that you know I'm gonna become an artist, be an artist, and live an artist's life. And, and that's a that's a risk that I took early on. I think. Um, what led you to that decision to sort of? Yeah. Well, um, initially, my uh, when when I graduated from high school and I went to college, I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with life. But I was sort of a you know like a C average student in high school, and I I, I was um, a bright kid, but I didn't really apply myself because I, I just didn't really care. And, so I didn't like um, academics. I didn't like um, you know homework and all that kind of like writing papers and stuff like that. So um, it sort of made sense that um, you know I, I that I pursued something that didn't require a lot of that. And um, you know I grew up kind of um, you know always um, liking art. Uh, I I never took art classes in um, high school or junior high or anything, but. Uh, I knew I was always kind of good at it. Um, I liked making things with my hands and um, drawing and painting and all that. So, um, you know, I had a conversation with my mom. Uh, and, and she was actually the one that encouraged me uh, to pursue uh, an art degree, um, <clears throat> which I think is rare. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, I've talked with several people who have just been like, everyone said I was nuts. And so to get that sort of family support is pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, it really was. And, um, you know, I mean, she, she knows me. She knew me really well. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I knew I, need, I wanted to get a college degree, but um, I also wanted to, uh, you know, study something that I was going to really get into. Yeah. Um, at the time, art seemed to be the, uh, the best uh, field. Yeah, and then so when I was in college, I started taking art classes, and I, I um, just loved it, and I wanted to um, know more about it, so I kept doing that, and um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was kind of the, um, that was kind of the beginning. One aspect of your work is that it's just, it's so playful, like there's just this innate playfulness, too, mm -hmm. that is um, still there by the end product, and... Um, a lot of people seem to forget the importance of sort of being playful um, in how we conduct our life and perhaps mm. how artists create art. Mm. Um, what about your childhood didn't take that innate curiosity out of you? Huh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think um, Picasso the one who said, you know, we're all born artists. Um, and, and I, and I, I, I kind of believe that, you know, I have a, a year and a half old daughter at home who loves to draw. And um, there's no um, sort of, uh, there's no rules. You know, she draws whatever she wants with whatever color, whatever. And, and she doesn't really um, know how to draw things yet. She just makes these abstract uh, marks. Yeah. But she's so uninhibited, you know. She she can draw whatever she wants, you know, and however her um, arms move. And I love that about um, kids and the, the freedom of um, art making that kids have. Um, I think along the way, um, through schooling, through um, you know adults telling them, um, you know, kids kids lose that. You know, I used to um, I used to uh, take my um, students my 2D design students over to an elementary school to teach, um, teach elementary school kids how to draw. And um, there was always this opposition from um, the faculty staff um, at, at the school, um, at the uh, elementary school, because it wasn't part of um, you know, the, the standardized testing and all that uh, you know, curriculum that they were interested in. In one class, um, I was... Um, you know, sort of walking around the classroom, and um, there was this one kid who drew um, a giraffe. You know, he used a yellow yellow marker, and um, he drew this um, you know really kind of cute little giraffe with um, I don't know short neck. It was kind of funny, but it has four legs. And I said, um, "Hey, what'd you draw there?" And he goes, "It's a giraffe." I said, "That's an awesome giraffe." And, um, and then he, he drew the exact same thing in pink. And I said, oh, what's that one right there? You know, with, with its short, you know, stubby neck and um, four legs. He goes, that's a flamingo. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, I thought, that's brilliant. That's, a, that's an awesome flamingo. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't think kids get that kind of you know, affirmation when they, when they make things that don't look like, um, you know, real life. So, um, even, actually, even the, the teacher who was um, sitting next to me uh, or standing next to me sort of corrected him. Mm -hmm. And she was like, um, flamingos only have two legs. And, and to me, I was like um, kind of this, um, you know, confirmation that, you know, education or, um, you know, well-meaning adults sort of, you know, kind of take that away from kids. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, maybe I was lucky, maybe I didn't um, really listen to uh, those voices. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the playfulness, I think, you know, I hope it's just um, sort of um, an extension of who I am. You know, I'm not yeah. trying to be, you know, I'm not constantly thinking about, okay, how do I make this playful? You know, it's sort of yeah. a, uh, something that's that just happened, I think. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I don't I don't really um, think about it. You know, I, I hope it's just some some kind of um, I don't know, like a reflection of um, who I am. How was it working with the with the kids for the permission to play in an exhibition? It's, yeah, that it's was right awesome. Next to yours, you those know, those are so cool. Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed by those um, works in there. They're really good. Um, you know, uh, I had a, that was one of my favorite parts about um, having a show at Laguna Art Museum was was playing, was um, being involved in that in that project with the kids. Um, but just the um, stories that I heard um, from those kids and the way they interpreted those stories into a sculpture, I was really impressed, you know. Like, I think, um, you know, those abstract ideas are difficult to um, sort of figure out, you know. Like, I, I, I tend to think kids don't have that ability. But when you break them down to sort of these bite sizes, you know, they're able to do it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, um, it was awesome. I loved meeting all the kids and hearing their stories and um, how they um, really got into uh, making the sculptures. And, and I think, I mean, I'm really actually very impressed by some of the works that came out of it. I, I was too. Yeah. I mean, it really flows really well with your exhibition. <laughs> yeah, it really right does. Yeah. How did, well, how did you, um, how did you get involved with the Guinard music? Uh, you know, I just um, got a, uh, an email from um, Sam Lee, um, my dealer, Sam, of, uh, Sam Lee Gallery, and uh, I think this was two summers ago, and he said, hey, um, you know, he just emailed me, and I think he CC'd um, Grace, who's the curator at the um, Lagoon Art Museum. Um, he was like, hey, you know, Grace wants to um, set up... Uh, a studio visit maybe later this summer um, so let me introduce you to her like, through email right. maybe five months later uh, I got a call from her and um, yeah, she said she she was interested in showing my work and you know, I was like yeah awesome yeah. and and apparently um, I, I didn't know this until um, more recently but uh, she has uh, checked out a couple of my shows at Sam Lee Gallery and um, has been following my uh, my work, uh, so which was really uh, you know flattering. And, uh, whenever I hear stories like that, I'm like, really, you've been Someone like following my work. Well, I mean, and that's especially an honor from her too. I mean, because she's just picked so many great artists for her exhibitions to mm. cover a few things yeah. that she's put together, and it's, uh -huh. it's always just really impressive. And uh, it just seems to be people who are yeah, pushing things in a new territory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's such an honor. I mean, and, and the you know the, the, the lineup. I mean, um, you know, Alison Sholnick is after um, me in the in the lineup, and I'm like, man, I love her work. You know, I'm always like, I've looked up to her work for you know for a while. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan. <laughs> so I was like, wow. Uh, the piece minor threat mm -hmm. is that. Any deliberate connection to the DC punk band? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I definitely borrowed the name, yeah. um, obviously, and um, and and the imagery. Um, there's similarities with the sheep, uh, with the black sheep of these. Um, it just sort of made sense, and it just um, worked. Um, so it's not a, a direct reference yeah. to to the band or um, you know their songs or anything, but. Um, I like that name. I, I enjoy the sound of it, and yeah. the, um, and um, I don't know. It seemed to fit the piece really well. Um, I, I because you know, to me, it sort of worked um, in two different ways. You know, is is the sheep the minor threat that the arrows are trying to take out, or is the sheep feeling the threat from all these arrows? Yeah, it's the minor so, threat. Yeah, yeah, so so I I, I don't know. I, I liked um, how it worked. Uh, um, different, like multiple levels, I guess. Yeah. Well, I like how um, you described it, where it's that moment before all the other arrows are going to hit, and it's going to turn into this even more beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, colorful um, thing. But at the same time, in that moment, you would imagine the sheep would be, you know, fearful and like, you know, worried yeah. about what's going to happen. And to me, it, it seems like a microcosm of 
the state of the world right now to where, you know, things yeah. seem to be going pretty bad, but, you know, maybe things won't be so bad. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, you know, at, at the personal level, it's, um, I think it's a choice, you know, when things happen, you, uh, you know, you, you can't control the things that happen to you or, you know, the, the arrows that come your way, but um, there's always a, a, you know, a choice to, um, you know, react to it in a certain way. Uh, your work is, well, it's surprising to the eye. There are just elements that just sort of jump out that you don't expect to be there. Um, is the, what piece in the show, when you finished it, sort of surprised you more than any of the other pieces? Like, oh, that's where I wound up, you know? Mm -hmm. so when you start a piece, yeah. I imagine you don't really have a perfect idea of what it's going to be. Yeah, um, I think the, um, the the centerpiece of the show, um, Huddle is what it's called. It's 11 figures in a, in a circle, um, in a huddle. Um, that piece was um, sort, sort of a surprise in that, you know, I never um, saw it finished until I installed it. Um, I was literally um, finishing that piece, um, you know, morning of the install. So I never got a chance to see it in its entirety. Um, in fact, the night before, none of those figures had any clothes on. And, um, and, and I, I, I hadn't um, even sort of put them in a circular um, uh, orientation and so um, you know I had a vague idea of what I wanted to look like and how it was supposed to work um, when I finally put it together in the museum uh, you know I, I was surprised at the you know kind of the um, I don't know the, the presence that it had you know and it, it, it kind of um, I don't know, like changes the mood of the space a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, so I was, um, that was a really, really nice surprise. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I, I liked the way it looked, I think a lot better than um, what I had uh, imagined. So, um, no, and it's, it's the freshest piece, in, you know, to yeah. me because it's the newest thing. Well, it's interesting just the way the viewer has to relate to that piece. You know, you are a client, you want to walk around, you want to peek over their shoulder, like you mm -hmm. want in. And then on the piece of paper, it's like these scribbles, like these markings, yeah, almost yeah. like something he's, like you said your child would draw. Yeah, or that was actually uh, my daughter's drawing. Was it? Yeah. Oh. So wow. it's kind of our um, first collaboration. <laughs> she probably doesn't know that. <laughs> How do you know when a piece is finished? Like, um, what is it? You know, um, sometimes. Um, Sometimes I don't. <clears throat> um, usually I have an idea of what the end product is going to look like. Um, other times I'll, um, you know, get to that point and um, sort of reevaluate it. So I have an end point in my mind. I'll get there and then I'll stand back and look at it and see if it is. And sometimes it's not and other times it is. And sometimes um, I'll rework um, pieces um, even after it's been shown once. Like when I'm making things and when I'm sort of immersed in this, um, you know, sort of process of making the work, it's hard for me to step back, you know, especially like if I'm working with a tight deadline. Um, and sometimes I don't really have time to, you know, stand back and look at it. And so, you know, I'll finish a piece, um, it'll go in a show, and then I'll start thinking, you know, is it really done? Is it really the best that it could be? Yeah. Um, and then sometimes um, we'll change it afterwards. Yeah. And it, it kind of happened with um, uh, still burning the, the bonfire skull pieces. Um, I had uh, when I showed it at Sam Lee Gallery, um, I didn't really consider the lighting um, in the space, and it's very well lit, um, and there's. Um, you know, natural light that comes through the, uh, the window. So the lights that I had inside the skulls um, weren't bright enough. And so when I um, installed it at um, Laguna Art Museum, I changed the light bulb that I used so that it would um, give off more light. And, uh, you know, that worked better yeah. um, in that space. Uh, that's it. Is there anything um, you'd like to say about your show? Do you have a favorite piece in the show? Uh, you know, I don't know that I have a favorite. I think my, um, 
um, Huddle is definitely um, kind of the freshest to me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, because I haven't spent much time with it. And I like the video in the back also, The um, Last Sunset Again. That's is a that, new piece. Is that your first video? Um, it's not my first video piece, but it, I've only made a few videos along the way. And, um, you know, like I said, it's like if I feel like a project um, calls for video, you know, I'll learn it, I'll, I'll use video. Yeah. Um, but mostly I think I just, I think three-dimensionally and, um, you know, nowadays. I love the, the 3D work. You put people, like, into the art. Yeah, um, yeah. And I just kept thinking, man, this is just, like, this weird fairy tale mythology type place you kind of disappear into it so um yeah i had a great time yeah well, thank so, you hey well thank you yeah nice to meet you nice to meet you as well all well, my cameras stayed alive so. yeah.